Today was the first trading day of the month of September. We closed out August yesterday with another gain. So we did have the best August in the S&P 500 going all the way back to 1986. And that was about a year before we had the 1987 stock market crash, which happened in October of 87. You know, though, Even though October is infamous for big stock market crashes, historically, the weakest month of the year for the stock market is not October. It's actually September. The month that began today is historically the month where the U.S. stock market does the worst. Although I do have a feeling that this September will probably be an exception to that rule because it really seems at this point, that there's no reason to believe uh, that this inflation-driven rally is going to peter out anytime soon. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if it did, but I'm just not willing to bet that it will. And in fact, we hit new record highs again today in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. The Dow Jones was positive on the day, up over 200 points, I think 215. It closed right near the highs of the day. In fact, we were lower in the morning. We were down over 100 points uh, early on. Uh, but, you know, nothing was going to keep this market down. The buyers came in. And so we had a big rally. But the Dow is still the major index of the three that is not hitting new record highs. Of course, Russell 2000, not even in the vicinity of a record high. Uh, but, you know, who knows? I mean, it might get there too. Uh, If uh, this momentum keeps up and if the Fed continues to support this market, which it likely will, and uh, the public is foolish enough to keep on buying without realizing, uh, you know, how this thing is going to end. You know, look at some of the individual names of the day, because first of all, we had the two big splits. We had the five for one Tesla split and the four for one Apple split. These companies began trading post split yesterday and they were up yesterday they were up again today apple up another 4.3 percent new all-time record high i'm not sure what the market cap is now i think it's about 2.3 trillion dollars uh for apple obviously it is the biggest company in the world uh maybe it's going to be the first company or most valuable not largest the most the highest market cap maybe it's going to be the first three trillion dollar Uh, market cap company. I mean, it's not that far away based on the way that it's going. Now, Tesla, Tesla wasn't as fortunate today. Tesla was actually down 4%, closing at about 475. Although pre-market, Tesla was trading at about 520, $530 a share until Tesla itself rained on its own parade. Because before the market opened, Tesla announced a $5 billion ATM at the market stock offering where it's going to allow a group of brokerage firms to sell Tesla stock into the market at the market price. So in other words, Tesla is going to unload the equivalent of $5 billion worth of its own stock so that it can put the $5 billion in the bank to have cash on its balance sheet. Now, of course, the main reason I think that Tesla needs to raise cash is because it's not making that much cash selling cars. It makes a lot more money selling stock than it does selling cars. So by putting $5 billion in the bank, that's a lot more money that it can lose. And of course, if the stock price keeps going up, well, they can sell even more stock at an even higher price and keep the whole thing going. In fact, even after today's decline, I think the market cap on Tesla yesterday was about $460 billion when it closed on Monday, which meant that Tesla was the seventh biggest by market cap stock in the United States, number seven. But if you compare it to the auto stocks, Tesla is more than twice as valuable as Toyota. Now, before Tesla had this, you know, rocket ship ride, Toyota was by far the largest auto company. And now it's half 
of Tesla's size. In fact, if you add to Toyota, Honda, Nissan, Daimler, BMW, GM, and Ford, if you add all those auto companies together, you still get a market cap that is lower than the market cap of Tesla. Now, I'm not sure you know what it takes for Tesla's market cap to equal the rest of the automobile industry. I haven't really done the math, but if Tesla's stock price were to double from here, then certainly Tesla would be more valuable than all of the other publicly traded auto companies in the world combined. I mean, think about that. One company, Tesla, being worth more than all of the other automobile companies. The entire auto industry would have a value less than the value of Tesla. And if the market is is being truthful, then what investors in theory are forecasting is that pretty much Tesla will own 50% or more of the world's auto market, meaning that half the cars sold will be Tesla's uh, or you know half the profits derived from the auto industry will belong to Tesla. Now, of course, that's not going to happen. I mean, it's not even come close to coming true. But of course, I don't think anybody who's buying Tesla stock even thinks about that, even cares about that. I mean, I don't even know if they care that it's an auto company. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Tesla is just a symbol. It's just four letters. That's all it is. It's just numbers and letters. The, the, the letters are the symbol and the number is the price. And it's a game and everybody keeps buying. And, and no one really cares about the underlying company or whether or not it can possibly be this profitable. Now, the question is, is Tesla overpriced or is the rest of the automobile industry underpriced? Like the same thing with Apple versus the, the Russell 2000. Is Apple overpriced or are the 2000 stocks that comprise the Russell 2000 underpriced? What's going to happen? Is Apple going to come crashing down? Is Tesla going to come crashing down? Or are the rest of the stocks going to rise uh, to, to meet these other companies? Now, certainly, if we create enough inflation uh, and paper money collapses, then it's possible that stocks like Tesla can stay where they are and the rest of the auto industry can simply rise uh, to bring Tesla's relative market cap to a proportion that makes sense based on its potential sales and profitability. Or, of course, Tesla stock can come crashing down or there can be some combination of both. But look, this is the biggest bubble that we've ever seen. We have the most reckless Federal Reserve that there's ever been. And so you get stuff like that. Look at what happened today with Walmart. I mean, Walmart came out and they announced that they're going to do their own Amazon Prime type deal. I think you pay $98 a year and you get free shipping and I don't know, you get some discounts or stuff like that. And the stock was up over 6% on that news. I mean, what the hell is that? 6% new all-time record high just based on that. And it's not like investors are worried that they're going to take any share from Amazon because Amazon stock was up 1.7% today too. It hit a new all-time record high. So everything is just going up. Of course, the stock that stole the show today was Zoom, right? Zoom video came out and their earnings really beat estimates. So the stock was up 40% one day. This stock, which is now $457 a share, has a 52-week low of under $61. I mean, this thing is soaring. I guess they should declare a split pretty soon or maybe wait for a thousand and then they can do a split and then this thing could really start to zoom. Look, I get the idea that more people are using Zoom now. The question is, is this a permanent shift? Because in order for you to believe that Zoom is going to continue uh, to have the type of revenues in the future that it has now when everybody is locked down and worried about COVID, then you have to assume that everybody's going to stay locked down and they're always going to worry about COVID. But that's not what the market is assuming. Everybody's assuming that we're going to have a cure, that we're going to have a vaccine. The market is booming because the belief is that, oh, the economy is going to get better. Well, then why are they also assuming that it's never going to get better? Because that's what you have to believe to assume that, you know, everybody is going to stay in Zoom and they're not going to resume their in-person meetings. But all of this insanity is because of the Fed. And, you know, we've seen 
examples of this kind of hysteria uh, in the past. I mean, it's not new. I think what's new is the extent to which uh, the Fed is is engaging in this reckless monetary policy. But, you know, you go back to the bubble in Japan that we had in the 1980s, the twin bubble in stocks and real estate that happened back then. And that bubble, like all these bubbles, was caused by a central bank, in this case, the Bank of Japan, uh, which was creating much too much money, printing a lot of money, mainly to prop up the dollar and to maintain Japanese exports to the United States. But in the process, uh, all of that liquidity moved into the financial markets, and we had this huge mania in stocks and real estate. And the markets today still have not recovered to the 1980s peaks. The stock market and the real estate market are lower today than they were in 88, 89. I forget exactly when the bubble uh, topped out. But the Japanese economy is still suffering the consequences of that bad monetary policy. Not just the bad policy that inflated the bubble, but the bad policy that has existed ever since the bubble popped. Because the Japanese government and the Bank of Japan has not been willing to allow the markets to fully rectify the enormity of the mistakes that took place during that bubble. And so as a result, Japan did not have nearly as healthy an economic recovery as might otherwise have been the case. And in fact, just recently, uh, 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 Prime Minister Abe, uh, you know, the founder of Abenomics, who a lot of people uh, think is a very successful prime minister, again, he came in and as far as he was concerned, the problem was we didn't have enough inflation. We needed even more inflation. We need the central bank to print even more money. I mean, what he should have done is said, you know what the problem is? We already have too much inflation. We printed too much money. We've kept interest rates too low. But instead, he came to the opposite conclusion that we needed them lower for longer, that that was the problem, that rates weren't low enough long enough. We needed even more inflation. And that was their whole policy. We'll see if they get a different approach with a different prime minister. But talk about the definition of insanity and repeating the same mistake over and over again and expecting a different result. The Japanese have been repeating this mistake now for better than 30 years. And they're still expecting a, a different result. But I remember during the peak of that mania, the land that was under the emperor's imperial palace, which was, you know, some gardens and, you know, some just some, you know, some land, the entire property, while it was a big piece of property, it was less than a half of a square mile. So in the scheme of things, it's not a lot of land. I mean, it's a pretty good size a plot for, for, for a house, although a palace, right? But it's less than one half a square mile. But the value of that real estate was more than the entire state of California. Think about that. Think about the enormity of the state of California. How much larger the state of California is even than the entire nation of Japan. I think, you know, I think California is bigger than Japan, but we're talking about less than one half a square mile of Japan being worth more than California. And California is the most expensive real estate in the country, right? <laughs> and all that expensive real estate, all that beachfront property, Beverly Hills, uh, Bel Air, right? Th that property around LA, but all the how, Laguna Beach and San Francisco and Santa Barbara and all Newport, all this Orange County. I mean, all that land, right? You know, from Northern California to, you know, to, to Mexico, wherever, the, the, all the way to the bottom, all that real estate combined, and it was not even worth a, a less than a quarter, a half of a square mile of Tokyo real estate. Now, I mean, clearly that was a bubble, but people didn't care. I mean, it just didn't, you know, that's, it was going to go on forever. And that is the attitude, I think that people have today. People are wildly optimistic on the stock market. We rarely get a down day. The market just goes higher and higher and higher. No one cares about valuations. Nobody even cares that the Fed is the reason that the market is going up. Nobody wants to fight the Fed. And people assume that you're going to have the Fed on your side the entire time. And, and nobody even believes that there's any adverse consequences. 
that, you know, that the Fed is printing all this money. We're getting all the stimulus. The stock market is going up, but that there's nothing bad that's going to happen, that there are no negative consequences for this policy. And of course, if that was the case, why did the Fed wait so long? I mean, if all they have to do is keep printing all this money and we can just have stocks go up forever, why did they have to wait for COVID-19? Why didn't we just do it before COVID-19? And, you know, and the reason is because there is a consequence. It's just that no one gives a damn about the consequences right now. In fact, the only investors that I can see that are worried about anything are gold investors, are people buying gold stocks. This is the only place I see any kind of concern. And, you know, before I uh, get to that topic, before I forget, I want to mention that I am doing another virtual money show. It began yesterday. It's uh, uh, you can go there on moneyshow.com. It's a metals and mining conference. And so it started today. I am speaking tomorrow morning. I am the kickoff speaker at 1020 Eastern Time, why the Fed's higher inflation promise will send gold prices soaring. So that's my talk. Uh, You can watch it live. It's free. Just register. Go to moneyshow.com and and look for this conference. And then on Thursday, September 3rd, so the following day, I am on the closing panel at 540 p.m., again, Eastern Time, putting it all together together what the trends in money, metals, and mining mean for your portfolio. And joining me on the panel are Rick Rule, Brian London, and Adrian Day. And those of you who uh, don't know, Adrian Day works with me. Uh, He is the portfolio manager for the Euro-Pacific Gold Fund, and he also uh, manages the separately managed gold stock accounts uh, for clients at Europe Pacific Capital and Euro Pacific Asset Management. But it should be a very interesting panel. So I would encourage everybody to check it out. And maybe while you're there, take a look at some of the other speakers and maybe have a listen to what they have to say as well. But the reason that I'm saying that the gold and gold stock investors are the only people that seem worried is because th- these are the only stocks that ever go down. I mean, gold stocks have lots of days where they get hammered. I mean, I would say that gold stocks are down as many days as they're up, right? That's not the case with the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ just goes up almost every day. Nobody is worried. But in the gold stocks, everybody is worried. People are worried that they're buying the top. They're worried that the market's going to go down, that gold's going to go down. I mean, they're in a constant state of worry. Even though we're in a bull market, and even though over the last year or two or three, the gold stocks have outperformed the NASDAQ as a whole, obviously there are individual NASDAQ companies uh, that are doing much better. But if you take a look at the entire market, uh, the gold stocks have, have outperformed. But despite that outperformance, People who are buying gold stocks are very worried. They're concerned about the market, even though the fundamentals have never been better. I mean, I cannot think of an industry that is going to help more by COVID-19 and the current monetary policy than gold mining. I mean, I think the gold mines are going to benefit more than, than Zoom. You know, yeah, I can see some benefit for Zoom, but I think the benefit that gold stocks will enjoy will be better and longer lasting uh, than the spike that you're getting at Zoom. Yet the people who are buying gold stocks are so worried that the party is going to end that they're very reluctant to join. And, you know, and they're exiting, you know, at the first sign of trouble. Whereas the people that are buying the NASDAQ stocks, they think the party's never going to end. They think they, they couldn't care less. We're going to party forever, right? They're, they, they haven't, the, the least bit of concern. And obviously, this is not going to end well. The party is not going to go on forever. It is going to end. Uh, and it is going to be a spectacular uh, disaster. The only question is, will it end in a way uh, that they've typically ended with a nominal crash? Or will the crash simply happen in real terms Uh, and not nominal terms, because the dollar will end up crashing more uh, than the stocks. And so priced in dollars, the stocks won't go down very much, or they may even go up. 
but priced in gold, it will be an even more spectacular crash as a result of the you know, collapsing value of the dollar and potentially other fiat currencies as well. Now, while I'm on that topic, earlier today, somebody had uh, forwarded me a tweet from Brent Johnson. You know, he's the guy that has this milkshake theory. He's the person that I bet a gold coin on uh, whether or not the dollar would be higher or lower uh, from January of this year to January of 2021. Uh, when we made the bet, the dollar index was 96.7. Today, it's about 92. In fact, it was lower intraday. We got below 91.80 on the dollar index before we had a reversal Tuesday type rally today. And so I think we closed up at around 92.30. The euro ran into some resistance at $1.20. Uh, and so it got pulled back, back down to about $1.19. But I don't think that this reversal Tuesday rally in the dollar has any significance at all as far as putting in a low for the dollar or some kind of change in trend. As I'm recording this, the euro is about 119.14. Uh, so the euro chart looks very, very strong. The dollar looks very weak. I, I think that the low that we put in today of uh, 91 spot 746 will not stay the low uh, for very long. I think we'll take that low out before the week is over, maybe even uh, by tomorrow. But of course, you know, we do have some economic news that is coming out. Uh, we have the jobs report coming out on Friday. So that can certainly be a big mover uh, in, in the currency market. So we'll see. But the dollar to me looks like it's going to get very, very weak. So I think Brett Johnson is going to be owing me another gold coin. Although uh, I think there's a lot more at stake uh, than a single gold coin. Oh, by the way, uh, Brett lost the bet that we made a year earlier. He already paid me a gold coin uh, because he bet that the next Fed move would be a hike. I bet that it would be a cut. I won and I got my first gold coin. And so this bet is double or nothing. And so far, it looks like it's going to be double. But I'm not going to count my chickens until they hatch because we have to wait until January. It's possible that the dollar could rally between now and then, but I think it is highly unlikely. But anyway, the tweet that was forwarded to me uh, coming from Brett Johnson had to do with his argument that we don't have inflation, that we're going to have deflation. And he's basing it on the fact that the Fed is not really printing money, uh, or even if it's printing money, it's not inflationary because the money isn't being spent. His point is that the Fed is lending money, not spending money, and that in order for there to be inflation, uh, the money needs to be spent. It's not simply enough to loan it. It needs to be spent. And to me, this is a distinction without a difference. What does Brett Johnson think is happening with the money that the Fed is lending? That money is being spent. <laughs> I mean, for example, in the last five months, the Federal Reserve has purchased $1 trillion worth of mortgage-backed securities. That is approximately one-third of all of the mortgage-backed securities that exist. And in fact, at its current pace, if the Fed continues to buy mortgages for another year, it will own the entire market. It will own all of the mortgage-backed securities that exist. I mean, think about that. I mean, if you think we have capitalism, how do we have capitalism when all the mortgage credit is flowing from the government? In fact, not only does the government supply the credit, it's also guaranteeing the mortgages. Because remember, the, the mortgages get originated and then the U.S. government guarantees the mortgage and then the Federal Reserve buys it. So the government is both insuring and originating the mortgages. And of course, how does the government insure the mortgage? Where does the government get the money if the borrower defaults? It gets it from the Fed. So the Fed is insuring the very mortgages that it owns. It's insuring itself. The whole thing is one Ponzi scheme built on another. But the one thing this is not is capitalism or a free market. This is a bubble that is completely created by socialism, by the Federal Reserve and the government. But the point is, even though the Fed is technically lending the money, the money is being spent. 
It's being spent to buy houses, right? People are borrowing money from the Fed and then they're using it to buy houses or remodel their houses or who knows what they're doing. Or if the Fed is simply buying a mortgage that is already in existence, right? Well, what is the person doing who sold that mortgage to the Fed? Now they have all this cash where they used to have a mortgage. Now they've got this cash. They're spending that cash on something. So the money is being spent. Even if the Federal Reserve is technically not doing the spending, it's doing the lending. Whoever is getting that money from the Fed in terms of a loan is spending it. And of course, the biggest spender of Fed loans is the United States government. The United States government right now is funding itself from the Fed. Better than 60 cents out of every dollar the federal government is spending. And it's spending over $7 trillion now. But better than 60 cents out of every dollar is coming from the Fed. It's not coming from tax revenue. More money is being printed and spent than collected in taxes and spent. Now, technically, these are loans, right? The Federal Reserve is loaning money to the U.S. government, right? The U.S. government is borrowing from the Fed and then spending that money. So I guess technically, Brent Johnson is right. The Fed didn't spend the money. They loaned the money. But then the government spent the money that the Fed loaned them. So what's the difference? The money is still being spent just because the Federal Reserve isn't spending it, what difference does it make? The federal government is spending it. And if you think of the Federal Reserve as part of the federal government, then it's just one part of the federal government making the loan and another part doing the spending. It's the same thing. It doesn't make a difference. The money is getting spent. And of course, it's not really a loan because it's never going to be repaid. The, the, the Treasury is going to just keep on borrowing more and more and more. And none of the loans are ever going to get repaid because the balance sheet is never going to stop growing. So I don't see how Brett Johnson can close his eyes to what is painfully obvious. I mean, if he really believes that there's no inflation and that none of this money is getting spent, well, how are we getting all this government? How, is, how are we getting three, four trillion dollars a year in government? Is it free? If you go to the uh, website for the National Debt Clock, you'll see that the U.S. government is spending $6.885 trillion. All right, so I was wrong. It wasn't quite $7 trillion, almost $7 trillion, $6.88 trillion. But it's only collecting $2.7 trillion in taxes. Where is that extra $4.2 trillion coming from? It's coming from the Fed. The Fed is printing that $4.2 trillion and the government is, is spending it. Basically, that's where it's coming from. Now, maybe some of that money is being loaned to it from private sources, but the majority of it is being loaned to it uh, by the Federal Reserve. None of that money is going to be repaid. We're not getting that $4.2 trillion worth of extra government for free. We're getting $6.8 trillion worth of government, $6.9 trillion worth of government, and the taxpayers are only getting a bill for $2.7 trillion. Where is the rest of it coming from? Inflation, right? So Brett Johnson thinks we're getting it all for free, that taxpayers aren't going to be on the hook for all that government. Of course they're on the hook, and it's not taxpayers, even people that don't pay taxes. Every American who earns dollars, who saves dollars, is on the hook for this inflation tax. And it is going to be uh, the most massive tax that, that we've ever seen. And it is the sole reason right now that you're seeing this rise in the stock market. The stock market is only rising because of inflation. The fundamentals are horrible for the stock market. And as I've discussed in the past, it's because the fundamentals are so bad that the stock market is so good. Because everybody knows that the stimulus is going to keep on coming. In fact, you know, they're debating this new stimulus now, the Democrats and Republicans uh, you know, they're trying to compromise or, you know, the Democrats want to spend three trillion. Uh, the Republicans only want to spend one trillion. Uh, so the Democrats are like, hey, let's just compromise on two trillion. They're, the Republicans haven't been willing to do that yet. But there was a poll that came out and 70 percent of the respondents, this was a um, Gallup poll, but 70 percent of the people 
want more stimulus spending. They want another stimulus check put in the mail. Sure, why not? Who wouldn't want free money, right? Everybody wants free stuff, so we're going to get it, right? The party is never going to end on Wall Street because the the money printing is never going to end because the voters want it. They want something for nothing because you don't have any Republicans trying to explain that there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, a lot of people think that it's the Democrats that are pulling the Republicans to the left, right? That the Democrats have gone so far left that they're pulling uh, the Republican Party uh, to the left. I don't really think that's what's happening. I think it's the Republican Party that is pushing the Democratic Party to the left because the Republicans are moving so far left, they're basically crowding out the Democrats. I mean, they're, they're, they're being forced to go even further left to outbid the Republicans for free stuff. I mean, that's what's going on. I mean, nobody is standing for liberty and individual government and small government. So if the Republican Party is moving left and promising all kinds of free stuff, the only way the Democrats can stay relevant is to go even further to the left. So don't blame the Democrats for this shift to socialism. Blame the Republicans because they've basically given the Democrats no choice. Uh, by moving to the left themselves. Uh, That's the only territory that they left open. (laughs) You know, and while I'm on politics too, the good news is that Biden's lead over Trump seems to be dwindling in the polls. And I think Trump now has a better chance of winning uh, than he has had, uh, you know, at any period in the recent past. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the riots and the looting and the crime problem and the the fear uh, that is now with the electorate. So I think that a lot of this Black Lives Matter stuff, a lot of these protests and riots, I think have backfired on the Democrats. I mean, they were probably hoping that this would hurt Trump by painting him as a racist and, and showing that his administration has fostered this racism and, and, and all this violence and that somehow the violence would stop if we elected Biden. But I think what's happening is more and more people are believing that the violence will actually get worse if we elect Biden. So this may actually be helping the president. I still think the odds are that he's going to lose, uh, but I think it's a lot closer now than I used to think. I mean, maybe it's even... Uh, a 50-50 shot. And it depends on how these trends continue to play out. But one thing in particular that will work in favor of of the president, I, I read this, uh, this interview online. National Public Radio did an interview with Vicki Osterweil. And I, I, I tweeted out and I put on my Facebook page a link to this Uh, article. And she wrote a book. And the title of the book is In Defense of Looting. And the interview was about her book. And, you know, how how does she defend looting? Now, first of all, looting is indefensible. There is no defense for looting. Looting is wrong. Uh, I don't care the circumstances. I don't care why you're doing it. Looting is stealing. Stealing is always wrong. Right. (laughs) You're not supposed to steal. So there is no rational defense for looting. Of course, she doesn't make a rational defense. She has a completely irrational defense for looting. Uh, Now, number one, you know, obviously, don't waste your money buying this book. Right. There's no point in even in even reading it. I, I can, you know, give you the synopsis. But of course, if you do want to get a copy, make sure you steal it. Don't pay for it. I mean, what? why would you buy a book that defends looting? I mean, just loot it, right? Just, you know, go out and, and take it. Obviously, you can't do that with Amazon or something like that. So you have to find a brick and mortar bookstore if there's still one around. And if you see the book on the shelf, you know, you just take it. Although the problem is, the bookstore itself would have had to pay for it. So I don't know how you steal the book, but still pay the bookstore because you want the bookstore to get the money. You just don't want the author to get the royalty because obviously this person doesn't believe in private property 
and doesn't believe that people should have to buy anything. So why should she get paid anything for having written a book? But that's, you know, a separate story. I, I want to just go into some of the more crazy parts of this article. And I would recommend that you read the entire article because this is some scary stuff. And this is the kind of stuff that's going to make a lot of people who might have voted for Joe Biden vote for Donald Trump. I mean, the real Trump haters are not going to vote for Trump, right? It doesn't matter. But there is a group of voters who are undecided, who could have gone either way. They might have gone Trump. They might have gone Biden. Because I think the electorate is pretty much polarized. You've got the people who really love Trump, even though Trump is not a conservative, free market guy. You have a lot of Tea Party Republicans who love Trump anyway. I mean, they don't care that he's making government bigger and running up the debt, even though the Tea Party was all about the deficit spending and reigning in the debt. Even though Trump is the biggest spender yet, he still is, you know, he still has the full support of a lot of these Republicans. But then you have all the, the, the Trump haters and they're going to vote against Trump no matter what. The Trump lovers are going to vote for Trump no matter what. I don't think there's any real Biden lovers. I think Biden's base are the Trump haters. You know, that's his base. Uh, and so he's going to get the Trump haters. Trump's going to get the Trump lovers. But then you have the people who are in between. And it's the people who are in between some of those guys who may have voted Biden. They read some of this stuff. They read articles like this about, you know, in defense of looting. And they're going to want to vote for Trump. So I'm going to read just a little bit from this article. And the reason I want to actually read from it is so that nobody thinks I'm making it up. Because otherwise, you're going to think that there's no way that anybody could be this dumb and say something this stupid. Well, uh, uh, she is and she did. And so I'm just going to read it from the article. So she says, one thing about looting is it freaks people out. God, why would it happen? Why would it freak people out? He says, but in terms of potential crimes that people can commit against the state, it's basically nonviolent. OK, so it's nonviolent, right? Well, I mean, some of this looting looks pretty violent, but she's saying, well, it's not, you know, she's not they're not hurting people. They're just stealing stuff. Right. But let me continue. You're just mass shoplifting. Most stores are insured. It's just hurting the insurance companies on some level. I mean, it's just money. It's just property. It's not actually hurting any people. So this is an exact quote. So she's basically saying, hey, no one's getting hurt. I mean, it's just money. It's just property, right? We're just stealing money and property. How would that hurt somebody? Well, what about the person whose money was stolen, whose property was stolen. Well, then she says, well, you know, it's it's all insured. All these companies have insurance. So maybe it's just the insurance companies that get hurt. But but who cares about them? I mean, first of all, not all of the losses are insured. There are deductibles. There are co-pays. But when the insurance companies lose money, people own those insurance companies. Shareholders own those policies and they have to suffer the losses. But then what happens is the insurance companies have to raise rates on the businesses that they're insuring. And now a lot of those businesses can't afford the higher insurance premiums. So maybe they have to go out of business. Or certainly if they stay in business, they have to raise their prices so that they can generate enough extra sales to cover the higher cost of insurance. And so everybody ultimately suffers when insurance companies are forced to raise premiums to cover these losses that this woman thinks don't actually hurt anybody because the losses are just, you know, paid by the insurance companies. But as dumb as that comment was, she gets much dumber. It gets way, way worse than that. All right. So let me let me go on to some more pearls of her of her wisdom. Right. So here's what she says about looting. She says, it does a number of important things. It gets people what they need for free immediately, which means they are capable of living and reproducing their lives without having to rely on jobs or a wage, which during COVID times is widely unreliable or particularly in these communities is often not available or it comes at great risk. That's looting's most basic tactical power as a political mode of action. So in other words, she thinks looting is great because people get what they need for free. All right, well then, I mean, well, how is that different uh, than just stealing 
you know, at any time. I mean, what 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 difference if if you steal something and the good part about it is you get what you need for free, then why is that only good during times of mass looting? If getting things that you need for free, even if you have to steal them, if that's a good thing, well, then it should always be a good thing, which, of course, it's not. Theft is wrong. You can't just steal something because you want it or because you need it, right? This is, this whole thing is ridiculous. But she's trying to say this is the great part about it. It's because people get what they need without having to work, without having to rely on a job, right? Why should you have to have a job and work to get stuff? You should be able to get stuff for free. And looting is a way to do it. But again, it gets worse. Let me read a little bit more. But this is a, a longer paragraph. I'm going to read this and then I'm going to comment on it. All right? She says, looting also attacks the very way in which food and things are distributed. It attacks the idea of property. And it attacks the idea that in order for someone to have a roof over their head or have a meal ticket, they have to work for a boss in order to buy things that people just like them somewhere else in the world had to make under the same conditions. It points to the way in which that's unjust. And the reason that the world is organized that way, obviously, is for the profit of the people who own the stores and the factories. So you get to the heart of that property relation and demonstrate that without police and without state oppression, we can have things for free. Get that? What she is saying is that the problem is capitalism. The problem is private property. And looting basically shows you how good the world could be if we didn't have capitalism and private property and if we didn't have to have jobs. See, what she's saying is the problem is People have to get a job and earn money, and then they have to go buy things. And the people who made those things also needed a job. They were forced to work by their greedy employer. And so now just because they wanted money, because they had to buy things, they had to go to work, right? And now other people have to go to work to buy the things that the people were forced to go to work to make. And looting just shows you that if we didn't have this system, if we didn't have capitalism and private property, we could all just loot. And see, nobody would actually have to work to earn any money because we could all just steal. And so nobody would need a job because everything would be free. You see, according to her, if we didn't have capitalism and private property, everything would be free. <laughs> now, of course, the sheer idiocy of this statement is where would all the free stuff come from if we didn't have private property, if people didn't have to work to produce stuff? She wants to live in a world where nobody has to go to work because nobody needs any money because everything is free. Well, where is this stuff going to come from? You know, if you go back to countries that had this ideology, right, the Soviet Union before it fell, or, you know, you go to maybe Cuba today or places like that or North Korea, is there a lot of looting going on in those communist countries? No, because there's nothing to steal. You, 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 you can only have stuff to steal in a capitalist society where stuff is made. If people don't have to work for a living, they're not going to work. And if they're not going to work, nothing is going to get produced. And people aren't going to risk their capital to start businesses. They're not going to innovate. They're not going to create products if they, if they can't make a profit. And you're not going to have all this production if you don't have a market allocating resources based on market prices and profitability. I mean, if we don't have all the things that she hates, then there, there's nothing There's nothing for free. See, this woman wants all the benefits of capitalism without, without having capitalism. <laughs> she wants people to be able to get everything for free and not realizing that the only way that they can get stuff for free is if they, if there's a a uh, free market that produces it and then they steal it, right? She somehow thinks that we can all be looters, that everybody can loot. We can't. <laughs> you have to have some people making this stuff that's getting stolen. And it's only going to get made in a free market economy with private property and with capitalism. But clearly, this woman is a communist, right? She doesn't believe 
in capitalism. She doesn't believe in, in private property. I mean, I'm wondering, does she believe that when you steal something that then it's yours or does somebody have a right to steal it from you, right? You know, but she doesn't believe in any of this stuff, but she's using looting, right, as a way to advance her socialist agenda, which is exactly what's going on with Black Lives Matter. And it's so unfortunate that so many people are so afraid of being called a racist that they're just bowing down and doing everything that these guys at Black Lives Matter want. They're, they're funding. They're making all these contributions to an organization that's main motivation is to destroy free market capitalism or what's left of it. And they want to continue to push America in a socialist, you know, communist direction. And when you read stuff like this, you know, this lays it bare. This makes it extremely obvious uh, where they're coming from. And, you know, this now is much better. I mean, forget about global warming, right? Climate change, that's taken a back burner. Now it's systemic racism that is the problem that has to be eradicated. And the way to get rid of this systemic racism is through socialism. I mean, that's how they wanted to get rid of global warming is through socialism. But now this is a, this is a, a bigger, more real threat. And this requires socialism as the only the only remedy. And while I'm on the topic of the Black Lives Matter protests and riots, I want to update everybody on the situation with uh, George Floyd and Jacob Blake, because I talked about both of these individuals a couple of podcasts ago. First, on George Floyd, I basically went over what I saw in the body cam footage from three of the four officers. And after I did that interview, I then was able to read a motion to dismiss that was filed uh, by Chauvin's attorney, who was the guy that had the knee on Floyd's neck, and, and read that motion in its entirety. And I, rec I recommended everybody read it. Uh, and I know that, you know, I expect that a defense motion to be trying to exonerate the accused. You know, I, I get that. It's going to be biased. But look, this is open and shut as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't see how there's a prayer of the prosecution convicting any of these cops, especially with the new evidence that came out. I didn't even see some of it where you had uh, the, the coroner's report basically confirming that if they had found George Floyd anywhere uh, with all that uh, drugs in his system, that they would have just ruled it a, an overdose, that it was just a political pressure uh, that caused them to say it was a homicide, even though there was nothing in the autopsy itself that would suggest homicide. Uh, the only thing that the autopsy showed was uh, an individual that had chronic medical conditions and lethal doses of, of narcotics in his system. And in fact, I, I mentioned on the podcast that it looked like that he had swallowed some fentanyl in the car that when the police first encountered him, there was this white dot that you could see on his tongue and then he swallowed it. Well, what I found out later is that Floyd was arrested by police a year earlier and he had drugs. And what he did is he quickly swallowed the drugs so that the police would not find the drugs on him. So he may have done that. He may have, when he saw the police coming, because the police mentioned that there was a lot of fumbling around in the car before they got there. I have a feeling that what Floyd did when he knew the police were coming and he had the fentanyl, he just quickly swallowed it, a much bigger dose than he would normally take because, you know, he wanted to hide it from the police. He didn't want to get caught with the drugs, so he swallowed the drugs. And, and so that's why he had <laughs> such a large concentration in his system when he overdosed. But I happened to watch Court TV report on this last night. And the reason I watched, I don't normally watch court TV, but I had read something that they were going to talk about it. And so I wanted to see how they covered it. And I was very surprised at how honest they were. Everybody agreed on court TV that the evidence pretty much um, substantiated the defense's case and exonerated the officers, including Chauvin. And what was so, I'm not sure the word for it, um, interesting, funny, uh, but the way they approached it is that they were almost apologetic for having to report this, this story, right? Because you would think that 
the idea that racist cops did not murder George Floyd, that would be good news, right? Because if you're worried that cops are racist and they're going around shooting people who are black, and then when you find out that that didn't happen, wouldn't that be good news? Except everybody wants them to be guilty. Everybody wants to believe that the cops are racist and that they are killing black people. And so the fact that they have to report that that did not happen, they're, they're apologizing for it. And in fact, there was a woman that was on the panel. And, and, and basically what she said is she was going out of her way to really say, look, I sympathize with the Black Lives Matter cause. I really do. She said, I know how horrible it is to be black in America. It's terrible. I mean, you black people really have a raw deal in America, you know, and the, the police are unfairly targeting them all the time. She said there are probably hundreds of thousands of examples of police unfairly targeting African-Americans, hundreds of thousands of examples. But for some reason, we just pick this one. Right. We just happened to catch this on film. And she mentioned that this case, the George Floyd case, is one of these rare cases where there wasn't any racism, where he wasn't unfairly targeted, where he wasn't murdered. Right. So we just picked the wrong example that we should have picked one of the other hundreds of thousands of cases where this does happen. But it just didn't happen in the George Floyd case, which I thought was unbelievable. There aren't hundreds of thousands of examples. The fact is there aren't that many examples. Yet I know that our black people, do they look more suspicious in certain circumstances? Yes, they do, but it has nothing to do with racism and it has to do with the demographics of, of who's committing the crimes and the police naturally being more suspicious of people who fit the profile of people who are committing crimes, which in many cases are young black males. And so, yes, they are going to be uh, scrutinized uh, more often uh, than older white females who aren't committing crimes in anywhere near the numbers, but nowhere near the, the hundreds of thousands that she's talking about. And in fact, you know, they, they went over a lot of good stuff on this uh, court TV but, you know, some of the things I didn't even mention and another fact that I learned from reading the memorandum of law in support of the motion to dismiss. And again, I linked that on my Twitter and you can actually go online and read the entire motion. All the exhibits are online as well, including the very powerful exhibit that I mentioned on the last podcast where you can see the officer with his knee on the suspect's neck who is handcuffed to the ground lying on his stomach. And, and this was the procedure uh, that they were trained to perform. But as far as murder, right, because they're charged with murder, uh, second degree murder, which, you know, they're, they're intending to kill Floyd. A couple of other facts that came out was number one. So originally the officers, they called an ambulance and then Chauvin, who was the, the you know, the, the, the veteran who had been on the, the force for, I think, almost 20 years. A couple of the guys were rookies. I mean, they had just started, right? So Chavez says, oh, you called an ambulance. What kind of code did you use? And they used the wrong code. And Chavez said, no, no, you got to upgrade that to a code three because we need the ambulance to come here right away. So you need to tell them it's a code three so the ambulance will get here quicker. Now, the significance of that comment is obvious. The prosecution is saying that Chauvin intended to kill George Floyd. He wanted George Floyd to die. Well, that comment is inconsistent with that desire. If you want to kill George Floyd, why would you want the ambulance to get there sooner rather than later? You'd want to delay the ambulance as long as possible to give you time to kill him, right? So clearly, if he's trying to get the ambulance there sooner, it's because he doesn't want George Floyd to die. And another example of Chauvin's intent to help George Floyd, despite having a knee on his neck, is that there was some discussion about putting George Floyd in a hobble. And what that is, is a restraint mechanism where you kind of tie him up. And again, the reason that they were restraining him on the ground, he was resisting arrest, but they wanted to make sure that he didn't injure one of the officers or injure himself. They were actually worried that in the condition that he was in, he could have injured himself. In fact, he could have ran into the street, the busy street. He could have been hit by a car. So they're trying to restrain him 
while they are waiting for the ambulance to arrive on the scene. And so they talk about, hey, should we put this guy in a hobble? And then um, Chavin says, no, 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 let's just hold him here because if we put him in this hobble, when the ambulance gets here, it's going to take a long time to get him out of the hobble and put him into the ambulance. And so we don't want to delay. We want to get him into the ambulance as quickly as possible. So instead of putting him in this hobble, which might slow down our ability to get him into the ambulance, let's just hold him here until the ambulance comes, and then we can put him directly into the ambulance. Now, is that sound like a guy who wants to kill Floyd? Of course not. He's thinking about the best way to save his life. Now, you can argue that maybe he shouldn't have kept his knee on his neck, but again, I'm pretty convinced that the knee on the neck had nothing to do with his inability to breathe and had nothing to do with why he died. I mean, the one question that I still haven't seen the answer to is why didn't the police try to administer CPR on their own? Why did they wait for the ambulance? Because that maybe could have saved his life. I don't know if it could have. I mean, maybe not. I mean, he might have been too far gone. And I'm not sure how well trained they were in, in CPR. Maybe they thought that it's better to wait for the professionals than, than try it themselves. But that's what they could have done. It's not that, hey, why didn't he take his knee off his neck? The knee on the neck wasn't doing anything. It's why didn't they take the knee off the neck and then use CPR, right? That's what didn't happen. And I, you know, we'll see if we get some information. I'm sure that uh, Chavin has a logical explanation for why he didn't do that. Because it certainly seemed that this guy uh, was clearly concerned about doing the right thing uh, for George Floyd. The fact that George Floyd died anyway, <laughs> it's not because uh, Chauvin or any of the other officers had any intention uh, to kill him. But we'll see. I mean, the charges should be dismissed against all four of these officers, at a minimum against the other three, certainly the rookies who were simply, you know, I mean, they were they were deferring to Chavin. One of the guys did say maybe we should roll him on his side or do something else. Uh, but Chavin said, no, I think we should leave him here. And, you know, he, he's the one that's got seniority. I mean, if you're if it's your you know first month on the job and a 20 year veteran uh, says we should do something, who are you to say he's wrong? I mean, you're going to respect the judgment of somebody who's been a policeman for a lot longer than you have. There's a certain hierarchy, you know, on the force. And, 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 and rookies will defer uh, to somebody who's seasoned who probably, you know, has explanations for why he's doing things that maybe, you know, you don't understand because you haven't been on the force long enough. So certainly the junior guys, uh, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, those charges should be thrown out, but I don't see how they can even have a charge against Chauvin given all of the evidence. Also, again, I want to update the podcast on Jacob Blake because I did mention the Jacob Blake situation. On the last podcast, he is the guy in Kenosha uh, who was shot in the back seven times, uh, kids in the back seat. And, you know, at the time, you don't really know. Again, you just see a little bit of this video. And, yeah, it looks really bad. Hey, they shoot this guy in the back. And that's all you know. Well, a lot of information has come out since then, uh, such as that he fought with police. He basically overpowered the police. He had put one of the policemen in in a headlock. So he assaulted the policeman while he was resisting arrest. The police tried to subdue him with tasers, right? They didn't just start firing their guns. They tried the tasers. The tasers didn't work. He was shot twice with tasers and apparently it had no effect. And also the guy wasn't unarmed. He had a knife. He had a knife in his hand, which is a deadly weapon. Apparently some of the eyewitnesses overheard the police asking or demanding that he drop the knife. He did not do that. Uh, he continued to run towards the car, which, by the way, the car did not belong to him. I'm not sure. Maybe it was his ex-wife's because I think they initially responded to a domestic dispute or maybe maybe it wasn't his wife, just a mother of his kids. I, I really don't know all those details, but they had been called in on a domestic dispute. And that car that he was trying to get into did not belong to him. Those were his kids, I think, in the back seat, but it wasn't his car. And I don't really know you know, what was going on in the minds of the officers as far as if they knew who the kids were, if they were worried about the kids or any of that. But they clearly were trying to subdue this guy who was resisting arrest, who had a knife and was running towards a car as they're yelling, stop, you know, go to the ground, stop. He keeps going to the car and who knows what he's reaching for in the car. 
Maybe they think he's going for a gun. Who knows? But the last thing they want to do is find out. I mean, if you think somebody might be going for a gun, you don't have to wait to actually get evidence of the gun because by the time you wait for the guy to turn around with a gun in his hand, he shot you, right? So if you're a policeman and you don't want to get shot and you're telling a guy to go to the ground and he's not doing it and he's already attacked you and he's already resisted the tasers and he had a knife, he had one weapon and he's going to get maybe another one. I mean, maybe the police had reasonable cause to fear for their own safety and to shoot him. You know, so again, you you know, there's a lot of encounters that police are going to have uh, with citizens, particularly citizens who are committing crimes. And at this point, pretty much everything is going to be caught on film now, right? Everybody's got a cell phone. Everybody can start filming the minute anything starts happening. And all you have to do is just rush to judgment based on seeing a small piece of information and that's what this guy you know the lawyer for the George Floyd case this guy Crump he is the same guy from uh, Trayvon Martin uh, I had the guy that did the Trayvon Martin hoax on my podcast where they put on a, a false witness they made up this false narrative about this uh, little boy a 12 year old boy uh, just going to get Skittles and iced tea and how he was gunned down by a a, a, a racist, a white racist who ended up being a white Hispanic. The whole thing was a lie. They put a false witness on the stand. Uh, they put some woman who pretended she was Trayvon's girlfriend, who pretended she was on the phone with Trayvon before Zimmerman uh, shot him. Uh, the whole thing was a lie. The whole thing was made up. The same thing with, uh, you know, the Michael Brown, hands up, don't shoot. It turns out that he didn't have his hands up. He wasn't saying don't shoot. He was trying to get the gun away uh, from the policeman. And that's why he got shot is because he went for the policeman's gun and he ended up getting shot. But the left immediately believes these false narratives. And that's exactly what they've done again. I mean, you got this guy and he comes out there and he immediately puts this spin on there. And, you know, even though the autopsy, right, the original autopsy that was actually performed basically concludes that he died of a, of a drug overdose because there's no other conclusion. When you read the toxicology report and you read the autopsy, there's nothing else that you can conclude but that he died from a drug overdose. But there was some political pressure on the, you know, on the office to say that it was a homicide, even though it wasn't. But then the family brings in their own ringer to do an autopsy, right, where they pay this guy $40,000 and he doesn't even do a real autopsy. He doesn't even get a new toxicology report. I don't even think he had access to the body. I think he did the autopsy simply by looking at the cell phone video. But then this guy comes out and says, oh, he was asphyxiated. He died of asphyxiation because there was a policeman's knee on his neck, even though the actual autopsy uh, revealed no signs whatsoever of asphyxiation. But why did this guy say this? A, because he got paid $40,000 to say it. But B, because uh, the parents or the, the, the family of George Floyd is going to file a multi-million dollar wrongful death lawsuit against the city. And they're going to collect on that lawsuit based on a murder, not based on a drug overdose. So they got to bring in a ringer who will say, that, that George Floyd was murdered by the cops because that's the only way they can collect a big check for wrongful death. And that's the only way the lawyer can get a big payday. He has to get 40% of a big number. So they bring in someone to lie. I mean, why can't anybody point this out? I mean, why would anybody believe that this autopsy performed by a hired gun from the family of Floyd that has a massive special interest in this being a murder and not a drug overdose, why would anybody believe these results? But the irony of this, I, I think the family is going to end up collecting. I bet that there's going to be a big out-of-court settlement. They're going to get a bunch of money for this. And you know what? So the officers might get checks too. I mean, I think these officers also have even better lawsuits than the George Floyd family, because I think the department basically sacrificed them to appease the mob. I think they had all the information at their disposal. They didn't stand behind him. In fact, I think that the chief of police, when he tried to say that, oh, I don't know why they would put their knee on their neck. We don't have anything in our procedures. We never have holds where you put knees on people's necks, even though the training manual has the exact thing there with a photograph of an officer kneeling on a guy's neck. So I think that these officers have a wrongful termination 
a lawsuit against the city uh, and, and, and defamation and all kinds of damages. So I think the taxpayers uh, are going are gonna to be paying, you know, on both sides of this. They're going to pay the family of George Floyd and they're going to pay uh, the officers who were wrongly accused and wrongly tried. And of course, depending on how long this whole thing goes on, are they going to drop uh, the charges or they're going to actually go through the charade of a court and then an acquittal and, you know, the riots that are going to be associated with that. You know, the longer we want to pretend that these guys actually murdered George Floyd, the worse it's going to be when they're acquitted, because then the narrative is they got away with murder. That's what happens. I mean, that's what happened with George Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin. There's like, oh, he got away with murder. That just shows you how rigged the system is. You can kill a black man in cold blood, even if the whole murder is caught on film. And if you're white, you can get acquitted, right? Even though, you know, one of the officers is black, but this is just going to support the narrative, right? That uh, it's a rigged system that you can't get justice, that it's okay to kill black people. You know, and maybe maybe this is what people want. Maybe people are happy, right, to falsely charge people who are innocent, knowing they're going to get acquitted, knowing that the acquittal will even do more to advance the first the false narrative than the the initial charge. But anyway, where I got into this whole discussion at the beginning is I think all of this stuff that's happening now I think it's all going to backfire on the Democrats and it is going to cause a number of voters who might otherwise have gone for Biden to go for Trump. Whether it's enough to swing the election back to Trump, I don't know, but I certainly think it's the best chance that he has. Um, and so it's not, it, it is not going to uh, deliver the result that the left expects. Oh, and going from the sublime to the ridiculous, I want to conclude this podcast by talking about a lawsuit that was just filed against the McDonald's Corporation from 52 former black franchise owners. They used to own McDonald's franchises. They don't own them anymore. They're suing McDonald's for a billion dollars in damages, which comes to, what, $20 million dollars per franchisee, which seems like a lot of money uh, that they claim to have lost uh, for these damages. But this is basically what they're alleging. They're saying that McDonald's discriminated against them by steering them to depressed, crime-ridden neighborhoods and setting them up for failure. They're saying that McDonald's saddled them with a standard 20-year franchise agreement with stores requiring higher security and higher insurance costs and whose $2 million average annual sales from 2011 to 2016 were $700,000 below the nationwide norm. As a result of having restaurants in uh, crime-ridden areas with lower sales, uh, oftentimes they went bankrupt. And they're saying this is McDonald's fault that somehow McDonald's forced them to open up these restaurants and deliberately set them up for failure, which makes no sense. I mean, why would McDonald's want their own franchisees to fail? I mean, it is a symbiotic relationship. They want the franchisees to succeed so that they can succeed. Uh, so they didn't deliberately set them up for failure, but they failed. I mean, Restaurants fail all the time. Businesses fail all the time. That's why it's so risky to go into business. That's why so many people choose not to do it. They go for the security of a paycheck, a steady paycheck. They don't want to risk uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, but clearly, McDonald's did not force these franchisees to open up restaurants in neighborhoods that had more crime. I mean, look, People are opening up restaurants in the communities in which they live, most likely. So if you have a black community, there's a high probability that the person who wants to open up a restaurant in that community who also lives in that community may, in fact, be black himself or herself. So I'm sure that these uh, franchisees wanted to open a restaurants in their neighborhoods, in their communities. It's not McDonald's fault that there was a lot of crime in their neighborhood. Why are you going to blame McDonald's for that crime? 
you know, I just went over talking about how, oh, you know, looting, this woman is saying that there's no uh, victims in looting, that it's not, you know, it's not real violence. It doesn't really cost anybody any money. Well, here you have these franchisees pointing out the cost of crime, of theft, meaning that the restaurants had to pay higher costs for security. Maybe there were more people that weren't paying for meals, whatever. There was losses due to theft. And because of that, uh, they, they weren't profitable. But I'm sure not every McDonald's or Burger King or fast food restaurant in these communities failed, but a number of them did. I mean, what is McDonald's supposed to do? Deny uh, franchise agreements to anybody in a bad neighborhood? Because what would happen if they did that? What if McDonald's said, oh, no, no, we're not going to allow any McDonald's in these uh, black neighborhoods because there's too much crime. I mean, they would really be sued for that. So they offered these individuals the opportunity. They gave them a standard agreement, the same agreement they give everybody. They're not saying they gave them a worse agreement. They're saying, hey, you gave us the same agreement that you gave all the white folks. You gave us the exact same agreement and you knew that we would fail because you knew that there's so much more crime in these black communities that we couldn't possibly be profitable. We needed special treatment, right? You needed a special deal for black franchisees uh, that would incorporate all these higher costs and these higher risks. I mean, give me a break. This whole thing is absolutely ridiculous. But you know what? Who knows? It may work. They get a sympathetic jury if somehow this case doesn't get thrown out of court and they get to a jury. You never know. Maybe McDonald's is going to have to cough up the money. And, you know, this is not going to end with McDonald's. I believe that we have set ourselves up for a wave, an epidemic of lawsuits, of racially motivated discrimination lawsuits, where former employees, black employees of every major company are going to get together uh, to get a huge payday by claiming that they were the victims of discrimination. Because after all, if we have accepted the false premise that we have systemic racism and the proof that we have systemic racism is the murder of George Floyd, which is why nobody wants to admit that it was a drug overdose. They need it to be a murder because this murder is what proves the systemic racism. But once we've accepted the, 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 the false premise that there is systemic racism, well, now all of these suits could succeed because every problem that somebody had if you're an African-American and your business failed or you lost money or something bad happened to you, it's obviously because some racist did it to you. Some racist corporation or racist individual, they, they, they intentionally inflicted this harm on you because you're black, right? And now you can sue. And now the juries are able to take it upon themselves to be uh, the basic deliverers of reparations. They'll simply look at this as, you know, a down payment on some type of slavery reparations. And they're going to slap all these big companies with massive awards because they're going to think, hey, it doesn't really cost any money. It's a major corporation. What do they care? And here's these poor oppressed people whose great, 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 great grandparents were slaves and they need money. And th this is what's going to happen. And I think it's going to be rampant through the S&P 500. You're going to have lots of these lawsuits, one after another, especially if they win, you know, or if these companies settle. Because once they start settling and writing checks, right, it's like, you know, waving, uh, 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 you know, blood at a shark, right? These lawyers are going to smell that blood and they're going to come, you know, from all over with, with new false claims looking to get a check. Right. And so this is what's going to happen. And what is it going to do? It is going to undermine the competitiveness of American businesses, because now American businesses, in order to stay in business, are going to be forced to pay this rent, this extra rent. They're going to be writing all these checks to lawyers based on bogus uh, discrimination uh, claims, and they're going to end up having to settle them. And again, what is this going to do to the small firms? The small firms, it's going to make them even less likely, even more reluctant to hire African-Americans. Uh, they're going to be scared, uh, you know, out of their wits uh, to do that uh, because nobody is going to want to subject themselves uh, to this type of litigation. And the only way that a small employer uh, can mitigate the potential legal damage is simply not to hire African-Americans. 
You know, the larger companies can't do that uh, because then they'll be sued because of the, you know, it'll be obvious because they, they won't have enough African-American employees. But if you're a small business and you got three, four, five employees and none of them are black, nobody can say you discriminated. It's not, it's not a large enough pool. And so even if you have some really, really good quality black applicants that you really want to hire, a lot of people are going to think twice about taking that risk. And a lot of people will end up going for a white guy, even though they, they actually prefer the black guy uh, because they just can't take the risk of this type of litigation. And it's going to be much bigger, right? As a result of Black Lives Matter, as a result of all this, there's actually going to be more discrimination against African-Americans. And of course, they're going to blame that on racism, even though racism will have absolutely nothing to do with it. Uh, it will simply be economics and government that will be driving it. But of course, the left will like it because now it's going to create even more problems for African-Americans. And now the, the left can blame that on racism and use that again to get their votes, uh, to continue to solidify their power and continue to push this socialist agenda under the, under the veil of combating systemic racism when the whole purpose is simply to use the myth of racism uh, to destroy capitalism. Mm-hmm.